morning. Wow, it's a bit loud. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. So, as Stuart mentioned, I'm uh, Scott Jenner from Mimecos, sales engineer. And today I'm going to be chatting to you guys about cyber resilience for email. And so, what is cyber resilience? And why do we need to stop talking about cyber security and now start focusing on cyber resilience? <coughs> well, the best way to sort of justify and explain this change in thinking is to chat about the evolution of email, basically focusing on that threat landscape of email. So what threats are we facing today, and what have we faced in the past? Well, the first sort of thing we started seeing was spam. We've all seen spam, it wasn't really malicious, just something that came into your environment was more of a hassle than anything else. But we developed ways around that. We started looking at black and white lists and kind of got that under control. Then we started seeing viruses. Now it's starting to get malicious. You get code that comes in an email and it's starting to actually do something malicious to your environment. Once again, we started looking at signatures, RBL lists, and we started protecting you against that. Then they were starting to get more targeted and more sort of complicated in their approach. And we started seeing things like phishing, where they're trying to get data from you. They're trying to get information from you. They're gathering information about your organization. And they're starting to use things like malicious macros, malicious URLs. Once again, we started doing sandboxing, URL analysis, the sort of um, anomaly analysis to try to pick up on these sort of phishing attacks. Then they got very targeted, started seeing the whaling attack, where they go and they gather information about your organization, they looked at your LinkedIn prof profile, they email into your organization pretending to be the CEO, um, asking the FD to make a payment, they maybe change your domain slightly using a one instead of an I, an R and an N instead of an M, and there's nothing actually wrong with that mail. There's no malicious content in it. There's no malicious attachment. There's no malicious URL. So you're having to use sort of special indicators to try to pick, pick up on that. But once again, we've developed ways to try to protect you against that. But what does the future look like? And why is the future evolving at such a rapid rate? Well, the way that we do business is changing. In the past, if I wanted to send someone a document, I'd attach it to an email and send it. Because now we're having to rely on things like OneDrive, WeTransfer, SurveyMonkey, Google Drive, and our users are being expected to use multiple SaaS solutions to do day-to-day -day business. How we're doing business is also changing. So we're working from home. You're doing bring your own device. I think someone was asking about that the other day. So we're not sitting behind the secure network, sitting behind a bunch of firewalls to help protect us. So the way we're doing business is changing. Also, technology is being introduced every single day that's supposed to better the internet or better email. A lot of the type of cyber criminals are using this against us. So what do these threats actually look like? Well, the one type of threat that we're seeing a massive increase in is this sort of compromised insider, the credential harvesting type of attack, where you get an email into your organization. It's basically a OneDrive link. It says to you, click on this URL, log into Office 365 to access the document. Your users have probably seen this a 1,000 times before. But in this instance, it's a fake link and a fake site. They go to that site. They land on something like this. They enter in their credentials. That cyber criminal now has access to your Office 365 account. And from there, they can launch an attack from behind all your security layers. They'll typically send that attack further inside your organization, trying to compromise more people. And then from there, launch an attack outside, possibly sending fake invoices, asking for data, that sort of thing. We were chatting to a uh, company the other day that had this exact thing happen to them. Over 2,000 fake invoices got sent out before they picked up on something happening. Other type of threat that we're seeing a massive increase in is a supply chain attack. So I mentioned the whaling attack, where they're pretending to be your CEO and they email your FD. They're now getting more advanced. They're now looking at who can I imitate that's in your supply chain. And once again, that information is readily available. A lot of companies have actually got an area on their site that says who we do business with, who our partners are. Go have a look at that. Look on LinkedIn, look on Facebook, identify what sort of areas they work in, and they can email in pretending to be one of your contractors, HSBC, someone in your supply chain. Same thing, asking for data, asking you to do an invoice. The BA breach that happened, we believe that was an example of a supply chain attack. The target breach that happened, I think, about two years ago, that was an example of a supply chain attack. So, the cyber criminals are not only using sort of new methods, they're also using technology in the way things are changing today. So all of you have got cell phones. Imagine a big chunk of you have got two cell phones. Most of you answer your emails and navigate the web on your cell phones. In fact, a few of you are doing that right now, which is great. Um, so cyber criminals know that. So they're sending you stuff that they know that you're most likely going to read on a reduced screen size. 
So you're using technology called padded URL or elongated URL. So you get something like this into your environment, you click on it, looks like facebook.com, lands on a page that looks like facebook.com, and they know you can't see the full URL. But it's actually something like this, which is not facebook.com, they've registered a completely different URL, and they've used the fact that you're gonna be using it on a small device against you. It's very small, but can anyone tell me if there's anything wrong with that domain? HTTPS forward slash forward slash apple.com. If you got sent that, did anyone have a, sorry? Nope, it's dot com, dot com. If you got that, would you be able to pick up that there was something wrong with that? I doubt it. What this is using is Puni code technology. Now, Puni code technology was actually developed to help better the internet, to help better email. And it was developed so that we could use characters from different alphabets. So that A in apple.com is from a completely different alphabet. That's from the share a key alphabet. So in the back end, this domain actually looks something like this. But the way that it displays to your users is like apple.com. Completely different domain, registered as a completely different thing. Your user will never be able to see this. And this is technology that was developed to help improve the internet. But cyber criminals are now using it against us. So you can see we're getting ourselves into sort of a defense arms race when it comes to cybersecurity. As something comes out, we try to fix it. As something comes out, we try to develop new technology around it. And we're in that sort of cat and mouse. And this is where we're putting a huge amount of our focus to try to stay ahead of the curve, to try to prevent a breach from happening. But in doing that, what are we forgetting about? We're just going, let's think about security. But what else is happening in the background that we need to start thinking about? Do we have a good business continuity plan in place? Are we going, if a breach gets in, or when a breach gets in, what do I do? Can I, do I have a secondary exchange environment? What do I do about my Office 365? Do I have a business continuity and plan that automatically invokes? What happens about my security controls when I invoke business continuity? Can I make sure that things like GDPR, are still com I'm still being compliant? Are my other security controls that I had in place before the breach, are they still in place during my continuity mode? So how deep do you go with this and how automated is it and are we thinking about it? What about my data? So if there's a breach, how quickly can I sort of contain that breach? How quickly can I identify what data is affected? Do you have the sort of confidence if someone sends you an email saying, I've locked down your CEO's laptop, give me X amount of money and I'll release it or I'm gonna delete everything? Do you have the confidence to say, well, go ahead and delete it? I know exactly which data is affected. I know how I can restore it. I can restore it effectively and accurately. How many of you do you think have that confidence to do that? The other area that we're thinking about is around, forgetting about, is around skills. And there's two key areas to this. The skills of our employees, are we actually taking the right measures to train them? Are we doing user training? Are we doing user awareness? How many of you had heard of Puni Code technology? How many of you would have even think to look for a letter from another alphabet? Very, very few of you. The other element is this, is around our sort of education of our security experts. There's a huge supply for skilled security experts that are able to take threat feeds from different areas of my business, say your IDS, your IPS, your firewall, your network, bring those into a SIEM solution and analyze that data to be able to look for sort of advanced indicators of an attack. Huge demand, not enough supply of that sort of a resource. So there's definitely a skills gap in that area. So I'm hoping you're starting to see where I'm going with this cyber resilience sort of theme change where we need to stop thinking about just the before of a threat. We can't keep thinking if a breach happens. We need to be thinking about when a breach happens and what are we gonna do during the case of a breach and after a breach. We need to focus on our threat protection, our adaptability, our durability, and our recoverability. So how do we do this? Well, we can't do nothing. We can't sit back and say, it's not gonna affect me, and if it does affect me, the results are not gonna be great. I can basically recover some of the information, it should be fine. Studies are showing that the sort of <coughs> repercussions of breach are becoming more and more vast. Reputational damage, financial damage, GDPR fines, um, all of the time if all your data gets deleted, it can do a huge amount of damage to your business productivity. So we can't just sit back and do nothing. What about the approach of let's just ban everything? My users can't work from home, they can't bring their own device, they can't work remotely, and I want them to use no SaaS solutions. That's gonna slow down your business. You need to be agile in today's business landscape. So having a strategy like that, is just gonna slow you down and do more damage to your business. 
Well, what about the approach of, let me just, I've got a little bit of security here. I've got a NAS device over there. Maybe I'll use it for some data protection. You know, maybe I can spin up another exchange environment on this VM, and I'll just get it to all talk to each other and kind of cuddle something together. It could end up being more expensive, not going to be as effective as you think it's going to be, and at the end of the day, it's just not going to work. So it's not a great solution. What about Office 365? Brilliant solution, and it solved a lot of the issues that you had with your sort of old exchange on-premise solution. But in terms of you thinking about cyber resilience and having a multi-layered strategy, you can't rely on a single vendor to give you everything around your cyber resilience, your continuity, your durability, your data protection. What do you do if Office 365 goes down? At the moment, you just log a ticket, make a phone call, see when they come back up and running again. So you need to be thinking about what can we layer on top of Office 365 to take a great solution and make it even better, make it more of a cyber resilient solution. So how do you actually achieve this? Well, we believe it's about using the right platform, a platform that is smart and agile, a platform that allows you to focus on your threat protection, your durability, your recoverability, and your adaptability within a single strategy. Now, we believe the Mimecast microservices platform is one of these platforms. And the way that our platform works is it's based on all these little microservices that, are, that we use to sort of compile and build all our solutions. So in the instance where we started seeing a huge amount of antivirus and anti-spam coming into the organization, how do we try to control that? How do we develop a solution for our customers? Well, we looked at the microservices that we had, got them to communicate with one another, and we were able to quickly and effectively launch our secure email gateway solution. Then we started seeing more of these malicious attacks, the sort of phishing and whaling where they're using sort of malicious URLs with embedded code and that sort of thing in them. Once again, how do we get to the market quickly, effectively, with something we know works and something that we know can help our customers? Took things that we had already in place. We got these microservices to communicate with each other and we were able to launch our TTP URL protection services. Then we started thinking, about, instead of just thinking about security, we need to start thinking about the whole sort of resilience, the before, during, and after. So are we able to give our customers a solution where we can say, we'll give you 100% SLA uptime if Exchange goes down, Office 365 goes down, G Suite goes down, a hybrid of any of them goes down? Are we able to give our customers a solution? Well, we've got this microservice to do it. We can just get them to communicate to each other one another, and we created our continuity solution, which gives you exactly that. Then came GDPR. We've got our data, but how do we give our customers the ability to analyze that data and effectively purge that data or change retention periods on that data for things like subject access requests or right to be forgotten. Once again, we had the tools, we had the microservices. It was just about getting them to communicate with each other effectively, being able to output a solution that we knew would work that was based on tried and tested, tried and trusted microservices. Then to try to address that sort of skills gap that I chatted about earlier, where there's a lot of sort of threat intelligence out there, but people aren't able to analyze them. A huge number of our customers were coming to us and saying to us, we know you've got threat intelligence. You analyze a huge amount of email every single day. Why don't you expose that to us so we can plug it into our solutions and we can start analyzing that data? Well, we already had an API microservice. We had an authentication service, get them to communicate to each other. And we now expose most of our APIs to our customers so they can analyze that data and do a whole level of configurations themselves. So to summarize, we need to move away from this siloed way of thinking, thinking about just security. That gets 95% of my focus. You know, if GDPR forces me, I'll maybe start thinking about my data and my archiving. And if I've got a little bit of budget left over, maybe I'll start thinking about my business continuity and making sure that my environment is up and running in the case of a breach or some kind of technical failure. You need to start moving now towards a cyber resilience strategy, thinking about your threat protection, your adaptability, your durability, and your recoverability in a single strategy. And this is what we call cyber resilience for email from Mimecast. Perfect. Thanks very much.